Thank, thanks, Asa, for the introduction and welcome to the talk. Uh, so uh, I'll talk about, uh, so this is uh, uh, the last uh, lecture of the season and uh, uh, it's a lecture, it's part of the collaboration algorithms and geometry and it's actually, it will touch on many topics and many PIs from the collaboration. And uh, so we'll start by a geometric question, then the lecture will take us through some computational complexity and we'll conclude with geometry again. So, uh, let's see, tilings. So a tiling is you take the space and uh, you take a pattern like this uh, hexagon and you fill the space by shifts, uh, by shifting this and repeating this pattern around. So in this case, this uh, mosaic is a tile in on, on this grid by hexagons. And uh, so today we'll talk about tilings and we'll consider n-dimensional space, even though because it's a, a talk will mostly, the pictures will be two or three dimensional, but generally it's an n-dimensional question. We want the shape uh, such that it tiles the space with an integer grid. So we take integer, we shift it one to the right, one up, one to the right and two up and so on. And uh, this fills the space. Uh, and uh, such tilings are sometimes called foams. Uh, and the objective today is to find the foam that minimizes the surface area of uh, the tile of the piece. So in two dimensions, it means that we want to minimize the perimeter of the shape. So that's our main goal is to find the shape such that we can shift it around to the right, up and so on to fill, to tile the plane such that uh, the length of the border is as short as possible. Uh, in three dimensions, it's, uh, the, it's the area of the borders between the individual cells. That's actually, this is a picture of a soap uh, film in three dimensions. Soap has this property that it naturally minimizes because of surface tension, it naturally minimizes surface area between cells. And in fact, it's a very, uh, those questions, uh, at least in two, three dimensions are pretty old. Uh, this is a paper by Baron Kelvin, the, the same as the degree Kelvin from uh, 1887 uh, about a minim uh, minimum surface area of uh, cells, specifically kind of uh, with the motivation from so bubbles. Uh, so that's the objective. Uh, and uh, we call, uh, even though kind of in higher dimensions, we are talking about boundaries that are n minus one dimensionals, we'll still call it surface area, regardless of dimension. So let's see kind of uh, some warm up results. So the tile just by kind of, uh, you shifted, uh, so if you take, uh, uh, because its shifts have to, to fill space exactly once, it will have to have volume one. And then, okay, so what is the smallest surface, uh, the, the smallest surface area shape of volume one can have? That's a ball in any dimension. And so, for example, in two dimensions, if you look at the disc that has area one, it will have, uh, radius one over root pi and uh, the length will be something like 3.54. That's an absolute minimum that we can hope for. And the absolute minimum, the, the best kind of thing we can aspire to in n dimensions is the surface area of the unit volume sphere, which is root n roughly. So that's kind of the best we can aspire for. Of course, that in itself doesn't work because for example, you cannot tile the plane with, with disks because there will be some areas that are covered twice and there will be some areas that end up not being covered at all. And more generally in, in higher dimensions, this picture will get worse and worse. So there will be more uh, problems. There will be points covered by many disks or many balls and points that are not covered at all. So that's kind of the best uh, thing that we can hope for. What can we easily attain? Well, the most boring tiling is using squares. So I can kind of 
the standard op uh, option for tiling a floor or a bathroom is using square tiles that you arrange. And that works in any dimension. You can arrange cubes uh, and, and uh, fill space with cubes. So that's always available to us. Uh, and uh, the cube in general, uh, uh, one by one by one cube has two n facets, which means surface area two n. So in two dimensions, we get a unit square, which has perimeter four. And uh, actually in general, I'm not uh, gonna, I don't think it's possible to find the exact answer to this question and dimensions in two dimensions, you can actually solve it exactly. And the true answer is uh, root two plus root six uh, given by this pattern, this styling. And uh, it's slightly better than the square. The square would have given us four, this is 3.86. Okay, so, so this is what we know so far. The absolute minimum is uh, the unit one ball that has surface area root 10. The thing that we could easily get is n in two dimensions. Uh, so, okay, it's reassuring that at least we got an answer that's between those bounds. It would be very problematic if it was not the case. And the question is, is the truth more like n or more like root n? So are there spherical cubes that have that behave like cubes and that you can pack them into space like, like you would pack boxes, but have a surface area that is more like a surface area of a ball. And uh, before answering this, uh, let's uh, talk, uh, what the, how do you measure surface area when it's 5 p.m. on Friday? So uh, it's way too, okay, so one answer is from calculus three. You can take some volume integrals. Essentially, it's like approximating this curve by a broken line or a polyhedron and take the limit as you take finer and finer partitions. This uh, works, but it's way too difficult for a Friday afternoon. A slightly less painful, but still something that involves counting is to partition the space into small cubes and see which cubes overlap with uh, with the boundary of the cell and count those and take the limit. So that still involves counting. So it's, uh, it's a little better, but it's still uh, tricky. So here is a method that uh, doesn't involve any counting, uh, but it's still kind of, uh, if you need to asymptotically figure out uh, the area, it actually works, uh, it, it works. So using probability. So we take a needle of length L and we throw it randomly onto this picture. So what does it mean? We pick a random, we drop one end at a random point X inside of T and then we let the needle fall in some direction at random. And we see if the needle popped the boundary or, or it didn't. So here it did, it didn't, here it did. And it turns out that the surface area, so the probability that the needle crosses the boundary depends on two things. It's proportionate to the length of the needle. Of course, a longer, a longer needle is more likely to pop uh, T. And it's also proportional to the surface area. So basically uh, this allows you to estimate the surface area by looking, for example, what is the longest needle that you can take such that the probability of popping the surface is less say than a half. So, uh, uh, so we'll, we'll see where it comes in handy, but uh, at least in terms of hand waviness, it's clear the advantages of this method are clear because it doesn't involve, uh, at least doesn't immediately require calculations. Uh, okay, so with that in mind, uh, so it turns out that spherical cubes exist. And in fact, uh, up to a constant, you can match uh, the surface area of a sphere with a tile that uh, you can take its integer shifts and fill the space, which is actually quite surprising. So you would expect, uh, I, 
initial a priori I wouldn't expect this to be the case. Uh, okay, so there are several proofs of this fact, uh, and uh, all of them give you a probabilistic construction using different techniques, but uh, all of them essentially, even if they don't say it explicitly, are motivated by a construction from complexity theory uh, that on the face of it seemed completely unrelated on making hard problems harder. And actually historically, first kind of this connection was discovered and then we got uh, out of this connection between so foams, which is what I've been talking so far and parallel repetition, which is a thing from complexity theory, which we'll discuss next. Once this connection was discovered, which is kind of the deep end of complexity, computational complexity theory and high dimensional geometry, both problems actually benefited and we got good answers for both. Uh, and this connection continues to be useful. At least I'm more, uh, I'm on the complexity theory end, but definitely this connection is still useful as uh, and continues to be useful and exciting as we'll see towards the end of the talk. Uh, okay, so switching gears to complexity theory. So if you were, uh, uh, if you had enough of geometry, this is a good play, uh, place to catch up. Uh, switching to complexity theory uh, and discrete problems Let's talk about constraint satisfaction problems. I promise you that we'll get back to forms soon enough. Uh, so many discrete kind of computer science problems uh, look like constraint satisfaction problems where you get a set of constraints and you have to satisfy either all of them or as many as possible. So this little game, you have to arrange those tiles such that uh, adjacent tiles touch with the same number, but many applied problem satisfiability has this form you have to satisfy all the clauses uh, pretty much all discrete problems uh, have this flavor and uh, one major project within computational complexity theory is to classify problems into say easy or hard i'm sure you've seen those kinds of diagrams with complexity classes so the one goal is to for example, say if the problem is anti-hard or if it's a polynomial time, but beyond that, we usually get uh, a much better idea and new ideas for both algorithms and what's actually easy and what's actually difficult in the process. So it's it's a grand project that uh, has yielded many exciting insights uh, of classifying problems. So a specific problem, uh, that we'll look at is graph coloring. So uh, the goal, we are given a graph, we want to color vertices of the graph and we want neighboring vertices to get different colors. So for example, coloring a map has this flavor, you're given a map and you need to, you want to color such that adjacent uh, areas are colored with different colors. Uh, so, okay, so is this problem computationally difficult uh, or computationally easy? It depends on the number of colors. So two color ability turns out to be easy. And it's, it's actually an exercise. And the reason it's easy is because basically you can't go wrong. So you start, here's a vertex, you color it blue. Well, this must be yellow. All of their neighbors must be blue. The neighbors must be yellow, blue yellow, okay, so this one wasn't too colorable because this is bad news. So it's not too colorable. And in fact, this procedure either succeeds or, or, or finds a very good excuse for why you're not colorable, this odd cycle. So this is a cycle of odd length. A cycle of odd length cannot be colored with two colors. So either you find a substructure that tells you that you're not too colorable or you succeed. So that was easy. Three color ability on the other hand, so this graph was three colorable because I can just use a third color here. This is NP complete. We believe it to be exponentially difficult in the worst case. And in fact, it's possible to construct a few thousand 
uh, node graph such that uh, three color in it would break some cryptographic system. So we believe, so at least sometimes it's hard. And the key difference is that you don't know. Uh, so in the two coloring case, it was clear what to do. Here, it's no longer clear what to do because, okay, this is yellow. This node can be either uh, blue or red. In this case, of course, it doesn't matter because it's a dead end, but in general, you, uh, that's the problem. So we get an exponentially growing number of possibilities to consider uh, because one endpoint doesn't force the color of the other endpoint. So it turns out that even in two coloring, there, uh, there is an interesting uh, difficult version of this problem and that's the approximate two colorability. So imagine we are given a graph that is not too colorable, but we want to satisfy, we want to color it such that as few edges as possible are unhappy. So in this case, we managed to color the entire graph so such that only one edge is unhappy because it ends point, its end points are of the same color. So Max Scott tells us uh, to, to find the two coloring that keeps as many edges happy as possible. It's actually an NP-hard problem and that's been known uh, for a very long time. And it's very interesting to ask, can we solve it approximately, right? So since we are anyway, we are, we are not trying to now keep all the edges happy, we are trying to keep as many edges as possible. So in practice, what you do, you try to keep as many edges as happy as possible. And the question is how close to the best optimal solution can we get? So say you can keep some number opt of edges happy. Can you, uh, can you find the color inefficiently that keeps, that makes 99% of them happy, that gets within 99% of optimum. Uh, maybe it's NP hard to get to an exact solution, but you can get within 1% of the best solution uh, quickly or within 80%, 40%. So this is an example of a very fundamental hardness of approximation question that yielded a lot of fantastic insights and connections. Uh, and uh, okay, so we can say something about it. If you just do the dumbest thing of coloring the vertices at random, just by dumb luck about half the edges will be happy. Right? Because if you take an edge, the endpoints are equally likely to be the same color and different colors. So you can get half the edges happy just by random coloring. So this is an easy result. A highly non-trivial result is that you can actually get within about 88% of the optimal solution. And this is by a very clever algorithm of uh, Gomez and Williamson, where the idea is you convert, you represent vertices as vectors in a continuous space and you do some clever geometry and continuous optimization and you get within 88%. You, you can get 88% of the best possible value. Uh, on the other hand, using another kind of huge hammer from complexity theory called probabilistically checkable proof, you can actually, proofs, you can actually show that it's NP hard to get within 5% of the optimal. So getting to uh, uh, getting within 5% of the best possible solution is NP hard. And under uh, something called the unique game, games conjecture, actually that solution, that 88% solution is as good as you can get. So the unique games conjecture actually implies would imply, we don't know if it's true or not, would imply that it's NP hard to beat uh, that uh, uh, solution, uh, the 88% solution. So, uh, so this is the Max Scott problem. There is a way uh, to represent Max Scott and in fact, uh, most constraint, uh, all constraint satisfaction problem in the language of games and interrogations. So uh, we can recast it as a game where there are two provers, Alice and Bob, and there is a verifier. And provers are trying to convince the verifier, say that the graph is too colorable 
or get as close as possible to convincing the verifier that the graph is too colorable. So in the, this running example that we'll have, the provers are trying to convince the verifier that this seven cycle is too colorable. Of course, this is not a true statement, but they can try. Okay, so the verifier puts, okay, so the verifier, the key is that the verifier is very, very local. It's only allowed to look at one or two bits. It's not allowed, if, if the verifier was allowed to ask them, okay, just present me with the coloring, then of course there wouldn't be a game, but the game is because uh, is interesting because the verifier is only allowed to ask very very short questions. So the verifier puts Alice and Bob in separate rooms, and asks them takes uh, adjacent vertices and asks them to provide the color. So if they provide different colors, the verifier accepts. They you pass the test. Sometimes, of course, uh, if they knew that they are always getting different vertices, they'll always uh, answer yellow, blue, and the, there will be no intrigue. They'll succeed for the wrong reason. So sometimes, let's say half the time, the verifier instead will ask the same vertex and require them to output the same answer. So then they go, uh, they, then they go free. If the verifier gives them uh, different vertices, and they say output the same answer, or if the verifier gives them the same vertex and they output different answer, then they fail the test. And uh, so then the verifier manages to catch them. So this is the game. It's a different way. The, it's, it's essentially, you, can, you could write just a list of all possible queries and try to optimize the number of them that get satisfied. So it's just a nicer, intuitively nicer way of thinking about constraint satisfaction that has uh, interesting applications. Uh, so the value of the game, so this is the game. The value of the game is the probability with which uh, the players can pass the test. So if the graph is too colorable, like this eight cycle is too colorable, they pass with probability one. So they're truly, they're trying to prove a correct statement. They can prove it with probability one just by answering the color of the corresponding vertices. Otherwise, the probability of passing, you can see that it's, it corresponds uh, uh, to the fraction of edges uh, that uh, the max cut solution can keep happy. So the best they can do essentially in the seven cycle is sacrifice one, one vertex or sacrifice one edge. If the verifier asks them about this edge, they will fail. And otherwise, they'll succeed. You can see that any other test except uh, this, uh, those two vertices on the bottom, they'll succeed. So the value of the game for an odd cycle is something like 1 over 1 over 2m. So uh, a typical question in hardness of approximation is, now I give you a description of the game. How difficult is it to distinguish between a game where the probability of uh, winning is high and a game where the probability of winning is low? So if I give you a game, can you tell whether uh, Alice and Bob can go free with probability 99% or whether they go to jail with probability 99%? So that's an example of a typical question. And uh, of course, there are different types of games. There are a lot of nuances, but uh, it's a major theme to understand relationships between values of games. And uh, one natural transformation uh, that involves values of games is, uh, uh, so a lot of the times we, we have a game and we want trans to transform it to, to a more difficult game. One way to transform it into a, more difficult game for the players, something that an, uh, an actual interrogator might, might do, is to issue n independent challenges for the players and require that they pass all of them. So this uh, game will be called g to the power of n. It's the parallel repetition of g. So uh, more formally, the verifier picks uh, n pairs of challenges. Alice gets her share of challenges, Bob gets his share of challenges, and they have to pass all the tests or else they go to jail. So uh, 
it's an important que a natural question to understand the relationship between the value of g and the value of g to the n. So what would we hope the answer to be? Well, from the viewpoint of Alice and Bob, they can just uh, answer those challenges independently. So if their chance of passing one of them was 99%, then passing two of them would be 99% squared. And in general, the, its value of g to the power of n if you get n pairs of challenges. And a reasonable conjecture that, uh, as we'll see, it's false, but uh, it's still a reasonable conjecture. And there is still hope to fix it somehow one day is that, that that's the best they can do. That basically, if they get uh, that uh, they cannot do better than just uh, answer independently, they cannot somehow coordinate different answers to pass the to win the game, to pass verification with probability that's better than what they would have gotten if they just answered the queries one by one. And uh, OK, so the importance of pair repetition is uh, so initially, and even now is for gap amplification. So some, suppose you worked really, really hard and you proved that it's NP hard to distinguish for some class of games between a game that they can win with probability one and the game that they can win with probability 99%. So maybe you're not too impressed because there is not such a difference. Okay, so remember that when it's difficult to distinguish, it's more impressive if this gap is large. So if uh, Nine, 0.99 and 1 are close numbers, so maybe it's not so impressive that it's hard to distinguish. But if you had per repetition, you can stick a thousand here. So one stays one, and this becomes a tiny number. So this is impressive that you cannot tell whether something is winnable or something is only winnable with a tiny, tiny probability. So that's kind of how. Uh, this field, uh, how people started looking at it. And uh, okay, so what do we know? So uh, again, it's late in the afternoon, so I'll stick to specific numbers. So suppose you start with a game where the probability of winning is 99%. So it's actually, an, uh, and we want to, the question is how many times, how many challenges do we have to issue so that the probability of winning becomes say half? So we want, to, we want them to fail at least half the time. It's actually not even trivial to show that, you know, if you take enough challenges, this probability drops uh, below half. Uh, and then there was a, pro uh, a progression of results that got stuck here. So if, uh, if there was justice in the world, you would uh, need about 100 challenges because uh, 0.99 to 100 is one over E, which is like one half. So what we can prove is that if you issue 10,000 challenges, then the probability drops to about a half. So it's a hundred square. And this is where this progression got stuck. And this is exactly where if we managed to improve this, we would have some interesting implications, uh, uh, specifically of the following. Uh, so suppose that uh, this result with 100 was true, then uh, the assumption, so we could start with the assumption that this point, this 88% approximation for max cut was optimal and uh, get the unique games conjecture from that assumption and get many hardness of approximation results that are tight. So it would have closed, it would have, close the big chunk of hardness of approximation theory by showing that many natural problems that we care about are equivalent to each other. Uh, alas, it wasn't to be. So strong pair repetition fails. So it turns out that for this odd cycle game that we discussed, so proving that an odd cycle is too colorable, that's the game, it has value one minus one over two M and uh, Ran Ras showed that surprisingly you can win roughly m square copies of this game with constant probability. And this is uh, surprising because a naive strategy, so if you were just playing each copy independently, so this is one minus one over two m to the m square, which is roughly exponential in negative m because this to the power of two m is 
e to the minus one. So you get to e to the m over two, which is tiny. So that's a terrible idea. Uh, there are several proofs of this fact. Uh, the original proof is an explicit strategy. Uh, I can actually give some intuition uh, for why it's true using information theoretic uh, reasoning. So, what is, so how do you win this game? So to win this game, you need to color those two vertices consistently. So you don't know if it's the same vertex or if it's adjacent vertex, but you need to, uh, to color them consistently to pass the test. So if we had this edge, if, if someone, if you manage to guess an edge, any edge, doesn't matter which one, that except for this one that we cut, we can color the, the cycle consistently. So we sacrifice this edge. And as long as we are promised that this is not the edge that we care about, we win. So, it, so imagine that there was a wizard of Oz uh, that can give us advice uh, about where to cut. So it turns out that such a wizard can give us such an advice while revealing only something like one over m square bits of information in the sense of channel information. Uh, so all you need is uh, this many bits of advice and you can win the game for sure. So this, if you take, if you take this fact on faith, then what happens when we take M square copies? Well, the wizard can give all of this advice and this is worth about one bit of information. And uh, uh, advice that's worth one bit of information, you can guess with a constant probability. So that's kind of almost like the definition of what it means to be one bit of information is that you can guess it with probability half. Uh, so kind of like in us, they can, the wizard is actually, uh, is not real, but they can imagine that there is a wizard and that uh, the wizard actually does something useful and win this game with constant probability with M square copies. So this is uh, kind of the story, uh, again, without calculations uh, on how to win M square copies of the odd cycle game. And uh, okay, so uh, knowing that such a surprising strategy exists, uh, we can go back and look at connections uh, to tiles. Uh, so this is the odd cycle. So we can uh, redraw it as a line number from zero to seven. So seven is zero. So it's uh, the endpoints are the same point. So what happens when we take a so two cycle uh, a product of two cycles, which is kind of like so we one one pair of questions will come from this cycle, the second challenge will come from this cycle. So this product is uh, a square. So this is the zero zero point. This is the four. It's the fourth row starting from zero, so one, two, three, four, and column number one. This is the two, seven, and seventh column is the same as zeroth column. So it's a, it's a seven by seven grid where the endpoints are identified with each other. So this is actually a torus. So it's a, it's a square where you glue the endpoints becomes a torus. So the product of two circles is a torus where this is one coordinate and this is the second coordinate. And what is the connection to foam? So, so imagine that th this is uh, the strategy. So what is a strategy? A strategy for Alice and Bob is uh, when you get a challenge uh, zero, zero. So you get zero in the first coordinate, zero in the second coordinate, you return black, white as label. So black label for the first coordinate, white label for the second coordinate. So the strategy looks like this. It's, it's just a coloring that assigns two labels to every, uh, to every point in the grid. Notice that it's a torus. So this point and this point are the same one. So they receive the same label. So now let's, let's point out all their mistakes. So every time the coloring is inconsistent, we paint it 
with the mistake. So here neighbors got the same label. So the first label, the second label is, is black and both of them, so you fail. Here the second label is white and not both of them, so, you so we fail. So we point out all the places where we made a mistake. And let's draw a line through all of them to, uh, so, such that we cut all the undesirable uh, edges. So let's call this set E. So now we do the following trick. We, we make a small picture of E and we repeat this pattern. And actually E turns out that it leads to a tiling. So we get this pattern repeated gives us a tiling of the space. Uh, it's, it's not a difficult proof, but uh, it, uh, basically the, the property that it came from valid strategies uh, means that it leads to a tiling. And now all the connection, hand wavy connections that we made pay off. So a challenge to Alice and Bob, what is a challenge in this picture from before? A challenge is a pair of vertices that are one, one away from each other in every direction. So a challenge is right like a random needle. A challenge that fails is a needle that cuts through E. Right. So what does it mean that you fail? It means that you touched one of the forbidden edges. So uh, change, challenges fail and correspond to needles cutting through E. So the surface area of, of this tile, which is the area of the bed set E, corresponds to the error probability of the game. And of course, it's kind of uh, it's uh, a high level talk, but I'm actually not hiding a lot of details. So it's, there is this correspondence. Uh, it's almost losslessly. And so a surprisingly good strategy, for example, one where a strong pair repetition fails translates into a surprisingly good tiling. And in fact, you get a tiling with the asymptotically possible, best possible surface area of root n. So if you are into geometry, this should make you, I don't know, I mean, it, as, a, as a geometry nerd, it makes me happy because we answer the question. It's a satisfying answer. It's very cool. Uh, in the complexity theory side, actually, it's kind of cool to know the answer, but it's not the answer that we wanted, right? So we wanted strong pair repetition. There was a reason why we cared about it. And we got the wrong answer. Of course, we, when you make a conjecture, you don't get to decide what the answer is. But maybe we can still salvage that conjecture. So remember that the goal on the kind of verification side was to make the game as difficult as possible for Alice and Bob. And here we were kind enough. So we gave them those challenges. And we were kind enough to tell them this is challenge number one. This is challenge number two. And they actually used it. In the strategy with the wizard, they relied heavily on knowing where is the first challenge, where is the second challenge, and so on. So what if we actually drew those curly brackets, which means that we give them those challenges, but not as a vector, but as a set. So we don't tell them which one is which, which is first, which is second, and so on. So this little tweak at least logically, it makes the, the game more difficult. Uh, whether it does or it doesn't, it's a different question. So, uh, But at least it rekindles hope for uh, strong pair repetition still holding. So let's call this G to the N symmetric repetition. And again, you can ask the strong symmetric repetition question of whether the value of the game uh, of the symmetric game, the best you can do is answer independently. So the previous counter example actually doesn't work. And uh, to address this question, it's actually easier to think in terms of forms because the condition on, on tiles is very natural. So the symmetric power repetition corresponds to the following question about tiling. So, and you can see that this is back and forth because this question actually is much nicer in the language of tilings, even though the previous question is probably nicer in the language of challenges. The, um, 
the non-symmetric case is easier to think about in the language of this uh, verification uh, to, to player game and uh, the information proof, but the symmetric case is easier to state in terms of tiles. It just uh, asks the following question, can, you, can the tiling be made with symmetric tiles, permutation symmetric tiles? So uh, a body is permutation symmetric if it, it, if it's stable under relabeling of axis. So here we have a shape. This is the x axis and this is the y axis. What if we switch the label? So this is the x axis and this is the y axis. Well, the picture uh, flipped. So this is not a permutation symmetric body, but this one is because when you uh, switch x and y, it's the same body and that's because it has an axis of symmetry here. And in higher dimension, you have more permutations. So in higher dimensions, one way to think about it is if the point 137 is inside the body, then all the permutations of the, this point must be inside this body. So the cube is permutation symmetric. Uh, the sphere is permutation symmetric. And of course, there are many others permutation symmetric bodies. Um, but this shape from the two-dimensional case is actually symmetric also. You can see that it has an axis of symmetry along the x, y, x equals to y axis. But in general, the shape that you get from this pair repetition construction is not symmetric. Um, so, uh, so that construction doesn't tell us that you can do, there are, that there are spherical uh, tiles, uh, uh, symmetric spherical tiles, so that we don't know. So here is, uh, so here is the picture. Uh, in the non-symmetric case, we saw that you get surface area that's very close to the optimal, that's asymptotically root n. Uh, as far as upper bounds, we still have the cube, but that's about it. And it turns out that in the symmetric case, the answer is much, much closer to n. So it, this is essentially n up to a root log n factor. So this is a tiny factor compared to n. So for most purposes, you can think that it's not even there, but it's actually it, asymptotically, this is tight. So there is a, both an upper and a lower bound. So you can actually do better than the cube by a factor of root log n, but not much better. And there is a huge gap between the non-symmetric and symmetric case. So there is some interesting math going on there. Um, so uh, just for some closure, where does it leave us, uh, like many results, where does it leave us with respect to strong pair repetition? So does it mean that strong pair repetition is safe because you can do the symmetric repetition? So the answer is probably no. Uh, so we, ne we don't have a formal proof, but there are probably other examples that are more complicated where symmetric pair repetition still fails. But we learned by working through this example through phones, we learned a lot about the problem and uh, kind of it definitely uh, uh, increased our understanding and kind of uh, moved us towards being able to formulate the correct conjecture about kind of how to make games harder in a way that actually works. So uh, I'll give a, a proof sketch. So the surprising result, so here actually it's an n over root log n result. There is both an upper and a lower bound. And the, the surprising result is the lower bound, the fact that the surface area is so high, it's almost n. And so I'll give a sketch of the lower bound. We'll give a sketch not of n over root log n, but n over log n, but it's very close. So it's definitely much closer to n than to root n. And the proof sketch is again uh, hand wavy as a kind of, so the previous proof was uh, we use sketches, but I promise you that actually I didn't hide too many details here as well. So consider the following game, spider game. So there are n spiders placed on the unit circle. So this is a circle of length one. You take n spiders and place them randomly on the circle. And there is a fly that needs to decide where to sit. 
So, and the game is such that the location of the fly has to be determined by the location of the spiders. So the location of the fly is a function of the location of the spiders. And it's not allowed to sit on one of the spiders for obvious reasons, because it doesn't want to get eaten. So this is the game. Uh, so then each spider starts moving. It, uh, each spider picks a random direction and starts moving with speed one uh, in that direction. And just for the, if you want to kind of, uh, I'm not gonna prove anything, but uh, the spider where it, they landed is the one end point of the needle and the movement is the direction of the needle. But uh, that, that, that's not important. They pick a direction and they start moving in that direction. And the goal of the game for, from the fly's perspective is to maximize the amount of time before it needs to move. So eventually the fly will move in particular because it doesn't want to get eaten. So the goal is to stay in one place for as long as possible. And when you move, it's kind of like when you cross the boundary of a tile uh, and with very few details hidden, the amount of time that uh, you take before you, you need to leave, one over that quantity is the surface area. So the, the more time you manage to stay in one place, the lower surface area you get and vice versa. And by the way, kind of you can, it's, it's less natural. You can actually place the non-symmetric case in this framework so in the non-symmetric case, actually what happens is that you have n different colors of spiders and n different flies. And the, the red spider only is scary to the red fly and the purple spider only eats the purple fly. And it turns out that in that case, all the flies can survive without moving for something like one over root n time, which gets us to the root n surface area. But in the, uh, in the symmetric case, all the spiders are yellow. And so it, when you throw n spiders on the circle, the typical gap between two adjacent spiders is one over n. That's their density. And the longest gap, if you do the math, so some gaps are longer than others, the longest one will be something like log n over n because uh, that's how the, those gaps are distributed. Which means that after about log n over n time, the spiders between, all, uh, if you look at all the points that they, they have visited, they will have covered the entire circle. So this gives us an absolute upper bound on the amount of time that the fly has before it needs to move. Because after roughly log n over n time, uh, every point on the circle will have been visited by a spider. So we know that after this much time, the fly must have changed its location, which gives us a lower bound on the surface area. It's actually shaving off this root log n factor is quite non-trivial and we learn a lot in the process, but just to convince ourselves that we have a huge qualitative gap between the symmetric and the non-symmetric case, it's actually not a complicated proof. I basically showed this proof almost in its entirety. Uh, so we are in the symmetric case, we are much closer to the lower bound. So there are some open problems uh, that uh, would be fun to discuss. So the uh, first couple of problems are geometric ones. So, uh, Okay, so we talked for a long time about the fact that there are spherical cubes. Can, I sh can we see one? So all the constructions are probabilistic and this is perfectly fine for Alice and Bob. It actually gives them a very nice probabilistic strategy for winning uh, M square challenges. But as far as geometry goes, you might have expected that it's, it's some nice construction. So we don't have good explicit constructions of a spherical tile, even though you'd expect that uh, there is no a priori reason why we shouldn't have nice explicit construction. A related question that makes sense geometrically, but doesn't make sense, doesn't have a nice analog in the complexity theory world is about convex tiles. So surprisingly, those tiles that we get are extremely non-convex. They're sometimes not even connected. 
but uh, it's actually, an, I, I wouldn't, I, I don't know what I believe in, in terms of uh, a convex style. Unlike this symmetric case, there is no nice kind of analog in the complexity theory world. So it's truly a geometric question. I don't think it has a good analog in the complexity theory side. Um, as I said, uh, okay, so you might have hoped that this symmetric repetition saved the strong pair repetition project. I don't think this is the case, but understanding where it, when it succeeds and when it fails is kind of, uh, it's a, an ongoing uh, question that has complexity theory implications. And of course, on the kind of verification side, are there other tricks that we can do to make the games harder that actually work, always work and get us the equivalency to the new games conjecture that we wanted. So uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, we have some time for questions. So back to Asaf.